So in many ways, um, this talk is about the same thing as my book, which is uh, primarily saying that theological bioethics, and especially Catholic theological bioethics, is not just theoretical, it's also participatory. So it has a huge political component and obligation. And I, I feel that Catholic uh, health facilities and the Catholic Health Association are great instantiations of that dual theoretical practical mission. But this morning I'd also like to try to add a slightly different piece, um, and that is the relevance of our theological commitments um, and theological doctrines, such as uh, redemption in Christ and the presence of the Spirit in the church, to our self-understanding as bioethicists and the, um, the hope and the potential for change that those theological premises also help underwrite. So in summary then, today's presentation is going to have three parts. Um, the first part will be about healthcare justice and Catholic social teaching, especially the preferential option for the poor. And I really feel like on that level, I'm preaching to the choir with this audience. Probably everyone here already knows all about that, but we have to do a little cheerleading at the beginning of the day so we're, we're focused and on board with this together. And then the second thing, as I've just mentioned, is development of further contributions of Christian faith and theology to bioethics. And then the final section will be on um, hope for change and how that is interdependent with concrete practical action and depends on that kind of action. So first of all, health care and justice in Catholic social teaching. We're all familiar with the fact that in 1993, our bishops wrote a resolution on health care reform. And what I'm going to ask is, 15 years later, where do we stand on this? But first, I'd like to just share with you a brief quotation from that 1993 document, which was written just as the first Clinton administration was attempting to overhaul our health care system. The bishop said, every person has a right to health care. This right flows from the sanctity of human life and the dignity that belongs to all human persons who are made in the image of God. Healthcare is more than a commodity. It is a basic human right, an essential safeguard of human life and dignity. We believe our people's dignity should not depend on where they work, how much their parents earn, or where they live. Now, 15 years later, where do we stand in this country? Although the reform initiative of the first Clinton administration failed, the issue is very obviously back on the table for the 2008 elections. It's mostly back on the table for the Democratic candidates, but a point I want to strongly make is that it should be, and we must make it be, also on the agenda of the Republicans. So I will talk more about the Democratic candidates but as a good Catholic, I'm not saying that the Democrats are the only morally responsible party. Instead, I am simply trying to say that health care access is an issue for all of us, a moral issue, and that we must make it central in whatever party we support. Democratic senators Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, however, are proposing similar initiatives that are at the forefront of their campaigns. Both of them want to progress toward universal coverage by making insurance affordable or even mandatory for the middle class and by subsidizing health care for the poor. However, neither a radical overhaul of the U.S. health care delivery system or a single-payer approach are on the table. Why is advocacy for far-reaching reform a moral mandate for Catholics? Let me just give you some examples. So rather than doing a whole analysis, um, and I certainly am not competent to do an economic al analysis of health policy, but just uh, give you a few examples of uh, why we're in a dismal state. Okay, last fall I saw um, two different items in the New York Times just about a week apart near Thanksgiving. And the first one was a story about a medical relief corps called Remote Area Medical which usually serves developing countries. But in July 2007, they had set up a health clinic opportunity on a fairground in Appalachia in Virginia. 
And in a three-day period, they tried to serve the health needs of 2,500 people. And at the end of the time, they turned hundreds away. And a volunteer doctor from the University of Virginia was quoted as saying, if you spend a day here, you see there's something wrong with health care in this country. Just a couple of days after Thanksgiving, there was another story. It was about a 21-year-old elevator operator in the Capitol building, whose name is Sergio Olaya. His mom had recently died of brain cancer at age 61, and she had left behind $255,000 in medical bills. She was well-educated and employed for most of her life, but she was between jobs for a few months. When an offer of a new job finally came with health benefits, she was too sick to accept it. Now her son cannot continue his education until the bills are paid off. And on the same page as this story, there was a photograph of uh, senators uh, in the Capitol building standing in the hallway discussing health care plans and debating whether universal health care would ever be accessible. Also last fall, many of us read in the newspapers about a so-called stem cell breakthrough. Almost simultaneously, two medical teams, one in Wisconsin and another in Japan, discovered how to create stem cells from skin cells. This research leap forward might make it possible, so the reports went, to circumvent the divisive ethical issue of whether it is justified to destroy embryos, whether they're embryos created for research or so-called leftover IVF embryos. Richard Dorflinger of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops called this breakthrough a very significant one that would be readily acceptable to Catholics. And as a New York Times article on the topic stated, with all the ethical issues seemingly out of the way, more scientists and money will be drawn to the field despite the admitted difficulty of downstream problems in developing applications. My point here is that access and costs, the plight of Sergio and his mother, are also ethical issues. Why is a lot of new money going to stem cell research when 47 million people still do not have health insurance? In our country, roughly 16% of Americans are uninsured. That means 84% are insured, though maybe not adequately. Lack of coverage or inadequate coverage results in millions of deaths a year, according to the prestigious Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. The Institute of Medicine urged four years ago that the U.S. attain consistent, universal, equitable, and high-quality care for all people in this country by 2010. We all know that we are the only country in the developed world, except for South Africa, that does not provide health care for all our citizens. Many who do have health insurance lose it periodically, like Sergio's mother, and many are denied coverage because for-profit insurers endeavor to cover only the healthy. Those who do have coverage often have extremely high deductibles or are denied coverage for specific services. A recent survey of patients in seven industrialized nations showed that Americans are increasingly frustrated about the quality of care they receive. This study was published in a respected health policy journal, Health Affairs, last summer. And it was conducted by the Commonwealth Fund, a private, nonprofit, nonpartisan foundation. Researchers interviewed some 12,000 adults in Australia, Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, New Zealand, the UK, and the US. They compared health care in both market-driven and government-managed health systems. Among all seven nations, Americans were the most likely to go without care because of costs, or to pay at least $1,000 out of pocket. Americans also reported the most disorganized care, the highest costs, the highest rate of lab test errors, and the second highest rate of medical or medication errors. 
They were also most likely to see their health care system as dysfunctional. U.S. health care was given poor scores both by low-income uninsured patients and by higher-income patients. And as other research has shown, African Americans are always subjected to substandard care, including less access to indicated treatments, whether they are low income or whether they are middle class professionals. Yet the fact is that most Americans live with a paradoxical attitude toward health care. When looking at individual cases, especially our own, we believe that everyone should have their needs met and never risk death or lasting disability because of lack of money. On the other hand, we don't feel personally responsible for the health care of others, and that includes being taxed to pay for it. We, or many of us, think government should keep out of the health care business and are willing to let market dynamics, especially in the form of employers' choices of insurance plans, determine the kinds of coverage people can get. More to the point, the 84% of us with insurance are not really motivated by concern for the 16% who do not have health insurance. Making people feel insecure about their own future care seems to be the only way to get voter attention. How can we overcome voting solely on the basis of self-interest and create a sense of solidarity with those who are excluded? A main resource for Catholic activism for change is Catholic social teaching. Catholic teaching about the moral dimensions of society, social institutions, and government centers around the concepts of the dignity of the person and the common good, the twin pillars of Catholic social teaching, the person and the common good. Since the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church has placed social ethics also in the perspective of the universal common good in a global environment. The modern papal social encyclicals bring gospel values and a sense of justice to bear on all kinds of important social problems. Every person, these encyclicals proclaim, has a right to share in the benefits of the common good and a responsibility to contribute to the good of others. Hence, we have both civil and political rights, such as free speech and a right to vote, and material and social rights, such as rights to food, shelter, clothing, a fair wage, and health care. These rights are not only for our own fulfillment, they enable us to, re to fulfill our social responsibilities. Yet Catholic social teaching has never been just about theories. It was also always about action. It is a living tradition. Principles within the tradition that support local, political, and activist work for justice are subsidiarity and participation. The principle of subsidiarity embodies the idea that groups, organizations, and structures of government at the local level have the right to determine and manage local community needs. Yet subsidiarity can also be interpreted to mean that when local communities, property owners, or investors are unable or unwilling to enact the concrete requirements of justice, the government or higher authority should intervene to rectify the situation. And the principle was used that way by John the 23rd in Mater et Magistra. Now, the standard of a good society is social justice, which means equality and equal participation within a framework of distributive justice and just institutions. But in order to attain justice, it is necessary to level the playing field. Hence, both justice and the gospel demand what liberation theology and John Paul II term a preferential option for the poor. John Paul II makes a special point of holding up the example of Christ's commitment to the poor and of exhorting societies as a whole, not only Christians, to practice the social virtue of what he calls solidarity. Solidarity recognizes the moral dimensions of growing interdependence among all individuals and nations, the hallmark of globalization. Interdependence carries with it moral responsibilities, including the responsibility to act personally for changes in social relations and in institutions that affect the common good.